Welcome to the Watkins Podcast. We are a United Methodist Church located in Louisville, Kentucky. On this podcast, you'll hear a selection of messages, interviews, and more with one of our pastors. If you're ever around the area, please be sure to stop by and say hi, or visit our website at watkinsumc.com. Now, I hope you'll enjoy today's episode. There's this great quote I get from the beginning of the book of the Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And it's a, a quote I pull from the story between Dallas Willard and John Orberg. John asked Dallas, what do I need to do to become the me I want to be? And Dallas has this great, significant spiritual pause, I'm sure. And he says, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. So that's what we're talking about today. We talked about last week and for just a few more weeks of ways that we were able to combat busyness and hurry and other things that cause us to overload our lives with this, that, and the other. And perhaps following Jesus is the way that we're able to get over all of these things. You see, part of the question we have to ask ourselves when dealing with our hurry and our busyness in this life is, how in the world did we get here? Well, you know, we didn't just get here overnight. We didn't just get all of a sudden to the place where we live at today overnight. I mean, we didn't immediately go from slow human beings to fast human beings. Yes, there was progress throughout history aided what we think is our own intelligence. You know, as far back as 200 BC, people were complaining about this new technology. I mean, imagine that with me, people complaining about new technologies. And they're complaining what it was doing to people, particularly children, and what it was doing to the society in which they lived in. This is 200 BC, I'll remind you. The new technology, the sundial, right? Here's a a fun quote from Plautus. Plautus is a, a great Roman playwright from 200 BC, and he writes these words, the gods confound the man who first found out how to distinguish hours. Confound him too, who in this place set up a sundial to cut and hack my day so wretchedly into small portions. <laughs> Isn't that a great quote? I must think I'm going to start using that. Confound the man, oh God, who cut and hacked my day so wretchedly. The sundial changed everything. Fast forward to the monks in the 6th century. We have our, our friend, St. Benedictine, and he, he organizes, a, the St. Benedictine monks uh, organize this monastery around seven times of prayer each day. That's how they kind of organize their, ta- their day together. And by the 12th century, the monks come up with this brand new invention, this mechanical clock to rally the monastery to prayer. You know, the first public clock was erected in 1370 in Germany. But the thing is with the clock, before the clock, time was more natural to humans. It all depended on the rotation of the earth on its axis. You went to bed when the moon got up, and when the moon came up, and then you got up when the sun came up, right? There were rhythms throughout the year that people abided by. Humans were more on this agrarian speed because that's just how we functioned. You know, until the clock and then that great hustle of the nine to five was born. You see, the clock changed everything. Yes, humans became more efficient with their days. They could tell what time it was and and schedule their time out. But I think it also let us become a little less human being. You know, fast forward to 1879 and another great invention made its way into the world. Do you know this invention? The light bulb, right? The light bulbs do many things one of which allows us to stay up past the sunset. All right, here's a stat for you. This stat may make you very angry. I get kind of depressed just thinking about it. Um, but before the Edison dis- to invented the light bulb, the average person slept 11 hours a night. Doesn't that sound wonderful? 11 hours a night. Don't you wish you could go back to those days? You see, the average American today gets around seven hours of sleep at night. Man, I am not in that average. I wish I got at least seven. I mean, imagine this effect from human beings from 11 hours of sleep to maybe seven. Here's another fun fact for you about our phones. A recent study found that the average iPhone user touches his or her phone 2,617 times a day. 2,000 617 times a day. Each user is on his or her phone for two and a half hours over 76 sessions a day. Isn't that incredible? 
I now, you know, my phone comes with this and yours probably does too, where you can see how much screen time you took up in the last day. You know, you may have that in your life. That's great. I don't need that guilt and shame in mine. <laughs> right? Now, let me be clear at, at, at the end of all this. I'm not anti-clock. I'm also not anti-light bulb. And I am certainly not anti-iPhone. But a question I think we all have to ask is this. What is all of this distraction, addiction, and pace of life doing to our souls? You see, I, I believe Jesus had a thing or two to say about this a few thousand years ago. The term he used for the way that his followers could fight back against distraction, addiction, and fast-paced lifestyle, that term is Sabbath. You see, Jesus is, is fully human and fully divine, and I believe in that fully understood the human condition. He knew that we as humans would have this restless desire within us because he would experience that same desire as well. He knew we would all experience anger and anxiety and disillusionment and depression, which can look like busyness, overload, and burnout, right? And he knew that the mix of all these things spirals us out of control where we just get busier and busier to combat it, and we feel like that is the solution itself. See, the word Sabbath comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat. Now, this word literally means to stop. The Sabbath, the Shabbat, the Shabbat is, is a day to stop, to stop working, to stop wanting, to stop worrying, full stop. You see, throughout our scriptures, there are commands to stop, to make every effort to rest. The great spiritual writers of our scriptures knew and experienced that it would take intentionality on our part. You know this part in your life as well. I mean, remember the last time you took a vacation? Maybe the last time you took a day off if vacation seems too long ago. Remember that day? You had to prepare for it. If you're traveling, you have to prepare some to-do lists, right? You need to get all the laundry done. You need to put your suitcase on the guest bed and pile those clothes as, as high as you can inside that suitcase, even though you can't take them all. You also have to do all the dirty dishes in your sink because, I don't know, you, somebody may sneak into your house when you're on vacation and say you have dirty dishes in your sink, right? You have to make, every, make sure everything is in order so that you could leave. You see, the same intentionality is what has to go into us taking a Sabbath in order for us to, to take a day off for rest and renewal. You have to prepare. You see, Sabbath was built into the rhythms of Jesus' life. It was a core practice that each week he took that day off. And, and there's a great story I want to share with you. It's our story this morning, wherever you may be listening to this, centers around Jesus taking a rest. He's walking through some wheat fields with his disciples. I imagine it being a beautiful day. Um, this weekend, it was gorgeous in Louisville, Kentucky. I mean, just 70 degrees sun. Now we're in heat warnings, but I mean, it was perfect weather. And that's what I imagine Jesus and his disciples walking through the wheat fields with. A leisurely walk with friends picking heads of wheat along the way. And as he's walking with his friends, a Pharisee comes up and yells at him. <laughs> imagine that yells at him and asking, why in the world would they be breaking Sabbath law? Why would they be working when they're commanded to rest and they feel like they can just stump Jesus? And Jesus responds in this most beautiful way. You know, I'm, I'm envious in the ways that Jesus responds to people who critique him. I'm envious of ways in which people are coming to really combat him, to make me stump him. Um, to kind of prove he's not who he claims to be. And, and every time Jesus always has this beautiful response, it's either this clear message or, or even a question in itself. But he responds to this way to the Pharisees, the Sabbath was created for humans. Humans weren't created for the Sabbath. Hear that again. The Sabbath was created for humans. Humans weren't created for the Sabbath. You see, Jesus responds in this grace-filled way. He helps to see uh, the Pharisees to see that a relationship with God isn't about following all the rules completely or, or maybe making sure that you feel it just the same amount of guilt and shame we do, right? But rather to get to the heart of the matter. Sabbath is good for us. And it's not something that we need to follow rigid and legal ways, but in a very grace-filled and fulfilling way. The Sabbath was created for humans. See, Sabbath is good for us because it is for us. It's a gift. 
And if it was good for human beings before clocks and light bulbs and our addiction to iPhones, well, imagine how good Sabbath is for us now. Sabbath. Shabbat. To stop. You know, I believe that in order for us to go, we have to learn to stop. So what do we do? There is a question John Mark Comer asks in, in his book of the same name about contemplating Sabbath, and his his question is this, what could I do for 24 hours that would fill my soul with a great deep joy? I love that question. What could I do for 24 hours that would fill my soul with a deep joy? Dan Allender in his book Sabbath writes this, and maybe this is going to help flesh it out for you. He writes, the Sabbath is an invitation to enter delight. Let's just stop there. Beautiful, right? The Sabbath is an invitation to enter delight. He continues to write this. The Sabbath, when experienced as God intended, is the best day of our lives. Without question or thought, is the best day of the week. It is the day we anticipate on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and the day we remember on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. Sabbath is the holy time where we feast, play, dance, sing, pray, laugh, tell stories, read, paint, walk, and watch creation in its fullness. Gosh, isn't that great? You know, Shabbat can be translated as, as four things. I don't want you to think about your Sabbath, your time away. And maybe it's not perhaps a full day. Maybe it's just a couple hours throughout the week. You know, we, we all have different schedules and stuff. And I, and I think taking a Sabbath, I think taking rest, one, it's a privilege in our country, right? And and two, we, we need to be flexible in what it looks like. But here are four things I think Shabbat or Sabbath can look like. One is to stop. And that is to stop all working, all thinking about working. That is the hardest for me, all worrying and all wanting to stop. The second is to rest, uh, to sleep. If Jesus took naps as much as we have recorded in the Gospels plus more, hey, maybe it's good for us to calm down, relax, process the week that was. Third one is delight. I, hey, I think we need to recover delight in our lives. Two things that spark joy, wonder, gratitude, and happiness. Hey, go eat some good food, enjoy some good drinks, listen to good music, spend time with friends and family. And the last one after delight is worship. Worship. And this could be grateful praise and adoration of God. This could be prayer practices, whatever that may look like. You see, one of the ways to engage in Sabbath worship, I think, is leaning into the simple. Because some days it just doesn't feel like we have enough time to Sabbath or we can't fit it into our schedule. Or, or some days it may be legitimate that it becomes difficult. And hey, I believe you can, if you can lean into the simple, you can lean into a lot. Here, here's what I mean by that. A while back, Molly and I participated in a thing called Louisville Burger Week. It was awesome. You know, we, it's if you're not from Louisville, you may have it in your own city as well. Um, but it's a time where all these restaurants from all over the city have, you know, one to two to three um, burgers that are less than $10 a piece for the week. And so the, the, the event is for you to travel to as many restaurants to taste their signature burger. Oh, my gosh, it's awesome, right? Louisville has tons of great restaurants, and so there are just too many to try. Anyways, we, we you, they would have everything. I mean, one of the burgers was a, a peanut butter and jelly burger. Now, my, my wife got one of those, and I made fun of her, but, yeah, it was delicious. And they also have kimchi burgers. I love kimchi, and they also have burgers made out of every wild game meat you could think of. But I think you can tell a lot about a restaurant by a classic traditional burger. You know what I'm talking about? House-made buns, a... A decent burger patty doesn't need to have two. It can just have one. Uh, cheddar cheese. You need to have some pickles, maybe some lettuce to get your salad out of the way. You know, onions come or go. If you put tomato on this, you are ruining it, and you can just exit this podcast, right? And then, of course, ketchup, mayo, and mustard. Oh, there's something good about a good, classic, traditional burger. Simple. If your restaurant can do a good, traditional, classic burger, and you can do it well, I trust you with a lot of other things too. Simple. This is what gratitude is for me on Sabbath. If you can lean into gratitude, you can lean into a lot. We have a lot to be thankful for, and it can be a simple classic cheeseburger, amen, right? Or we can get through a, a difficult week. 
Gratitude can rewire our minds to find the good in the world and I believe grow us closer and closer to God. You see, what I want you to do for for today and as you listen to this, maybe afterwards and maybe practice for a couple days or nights in rows, that choose a time throughout your day and just write four things you're great you're grateful for. Four things that brought you joy. Four things that you thought, hey, you know what? God made a way there where there was no way. And, and for that I am grateful. Four ways in we can say, I know that there is a God who loves me because X, Y, and Z happened today. It can be as simple or as large as you want. But I think leaning into the simple, leaning into gratitude in our lives can help us to slow down, to see what's really in front of us, and to center ourselves on what matters most. Grace and peace, my friend.